11th academic session. The topic for this session is Built Heritage Management, National and International Perspectives. In this session, we have four speakers. First, we have Ms. Ushmita Basu, Assistant Professor, Army Institute of Management. I call upon all the speakers to kindly come up on the dais. Built Heritage Management and Sustainable Tourism, a review of a lesser known town of Guptipara, that's her topic. She would be followed by Professor Sergio Mustieta. Professor Mustieta would be joining us from the Republic of Moldova. And uh, he is the History and Geography Faculty, Iron Kringa State University. And he'll be talking about Soroka Medieval Castle. After Prof Professor Mustieta, will be joined by another eminent speakers from abroad, Mr. Eduardo Bedin, Supervisor, Glenfinnan Monument, National Trust for Scotland, and he would speak on compatible tourism in Scotland during COVID-19. The next speaker would be Dr. John Kerman, Senior Lecturer in Heritage Evaluation, Cambridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage, University of Birmingham. He will be talking on the managing the built heritage an international perspective. This session would be chaired by, coordinated by, Professor S. B. Ota. We'd be joined uh, by Sergio Mustieta from the Republic of Moldova at 2.20. So I would request our first speaker, Ms. Asmita Basu, uh, with the permission of the coordinator, to begin her deliberation. So our first speaker is uh, Ms. Asmita Basu, she is an assistant professor in Army Institute of Management and she will be speaking on built heritage management and sustainable tourism, a review of the lesser known town of Guptipara. West Bengal. Yes, madam. Now, for the time being, we can remove this screen, no? Yeah. No, th that's through NET, actually. No. So uh, you can. No, they'll be joining at 2.20. Yes, madam. Good afternoon, one and all present here. My heartfelt pranam to revered Secretary Maharajji and uh, greetings to all the person present here, respected Chairperson. And at the outset, I would like to thank Professor Durga Basu for giving me this opportunity to be here. And definitely Maharajji from Indological Studies also, he has um, given this opportunity that I am uh, standing in front of you and presenting uh, a small paper. Basically, uh, today's topic is built heritage in India. And I personally uh, feel that it is at this particular point that we need to focus our attention to certain uh, wider aspects of heritage. And thereby I have chosen this topic of built heritage management. Uh, pardon me, I am not a historian, neither an archaeologist. I'm a core person from management discipline. But uh, during my uh, visits, uh, 
what I have felt is there is a dearth of holistic approach in uh, managing the heritages and the cultural aspect of our country. And these two are the core aspect and uh, of our country. So these uh, would be required to be highlighted at every level. So it is not only uh, the job of uh, a, a particular person who is involved in the archaeological activities, conservation and preservation, but also if we have in team people from other disciplines, it will actually be a very good approach in highlighting these cultural aspects of our country. So. As we know that basically heritage and uh, is a buzzword now and um, people are more attracted towards the word heritage, cultural heritage nowadays without understanding its actual meaning. So it is the responsibility for us like um, the researchers, the academicians to uh, uh, make aware the people that what is the richness of this heritage and not only about the richness but how we can take this to the next level, how we can sustainably manage these heritage so that it can be presented as a gift for our future generation. And it is not like what I had seen, I cannot tell my children that see that monument no longer exists, which I had once visited with my mother or with my father. So that is our responsibility. And definitely uh, UNESCO's convention of 1972 concerning the protection of this world cultural and natural heritage is also mentioning this particular aspect considering uh, the deterioration or the disappearance so that is of prime concern so definitely we have to uh, understand the importance of the heritage that we have in and around and it is also interesting to note that we are mostly aware of those which are being regularly uh, discussed or uh, things which we have seen regularly uh, coming up like places or heritage monuments which are being in discussion but it is definitely very important that we put emphasis on places which are not very much familiar with uh, the people are not familiar with so if I uh, perceive that particular information that these are the heritages apart from the world heritages that we are already aware about so there are local heritages which we need to identify and again that's why I have chosen this uh, particular region of a very small town or you can better say a, a village in Hooghly district and uh, here talking about uh, the aspect of tourism I bring in the aspect of tourism with heritage hand in hand because heritage tourism is now what is uh, important uh, for the travelers as well we have seen that travelers and tourists from different parts of the world are very interested in traveling to those places which are having significant cultural heritage and they get more knowledge about that particular uh, regions, um, cultural aspect, uh, the people, the tangible as well as the intangible cultural heritages. So if we connect the three elements of built heritage also, we can see that there are the people of the host area residing in the built heritage region as well, then connected by the tourism industry and the holiday makers. So now we have to bring these three forces in this particular triangle and they have to be interconnected. What um, during my study what I found is the triangles um, is not very much uh, in prominence because the three factors are not very much aware about one another. So it is a particular connecting link which is required to connect these particular angles, I would say, or the corners of the triangle. So basically my study, the objectives, as you can see, uh, it's related to uh, identifying these local cultural heritage. And um, being a person from management, I would um, 
like to suggest certain strategies and ways. It is my suggestion, and definitely uh, all the dignitaries and respected uh, senior professors are here, so I would um, ask for their suggestion and opinion that how we can um, go hand in hand for an holistic approach for a better heritage management, leading to the sustainable development. So coming to the region, this is the geography of the region, you can see. Is it working? Yeah. So this is the area of Guptipara, very uh, small village or a town, small town you can say, in Hooghly district. And these are the subdivisions of the Hooghly district. And this is actually, Guptipara is located over here in this northeastern part of the Hooghly district. In the Balagar, <coughs> excuse me, subdivision. So this particular uh, Guptipara is well known amongst uh, some of us like in Bengal because um, in Bengal uh, what is very significant festival we have is the Durga Puja and uh, not only in Bengal but it is across the world that people are aware about this Durga Puja but the Durga Puja that we see nowadays that is the community style Durga Puja had its origin in this Guptipara where uh, some people were actually not allowed to participate in the uh, festival done in certain homes so they had formed a community of 12 people and we call it Baro Yari. So Baro Yari means 12 friends who had this community and then they established this Durga Puja. So nowadays whatever we find in Kolkata and all over West Bengal they are the community style of Durga Puja that had originated in Guptipara. Also famous for its uh, sweets and definitely it was uh, the famous uh, Gupo Shandesh. Shandesh is famous for in Bengal and particular Gupo Shandesh is famous from Guptipara. And uh, we have also a certain inputs from the uh, folk songs. Uh, we have Bhola Mara's folk song, and uh, you can understand that the region. The, my objective for highlighting these points is that the region is not only uh, rich in the built heritage, but it has also uh, got a rich uh, experiences in the intangible cultural heritage as well. Now coming to the temple complex in the Guptipara. So this is the Guptipara Brindavan Chandra Mat. And this is a particular temple complex that uh, we'll be uh, discussing today. And uh, why I have cho uh, chosen this because I happened to visit there as a part of uh, a heritage walk and uh, like me there were people who were not very much aware of this particular temple complex even though they had been residents of the Hooghly district itself. So I came across this I would say uh, a heritage gem and there are four temples as I have listed the Chaitanya Deva, Vrindavan Chandra, Ramachandra and Krishna. Chandra. So all these four temples are housed in one complex. So this is the Chaitanya temple and it was constructed in different, the entire complex was not constructed at once but different phases of time. Uh, in the 16th century, uh, Vishwa Roy had uh, constructed this and it is in the uh, typical Bengali hut style and the Jor Bangla style of temple architecture that we can say, uh, see over here and it is said that it is uh, the oldest of the temples in the Guptipara region. Now coming to the Brindavan Chandra temple which is the focus of this particular temple complex uh, is that um, this particular Brindavan Chandra temple, again, uh, there are terracotta works on the outer uh, side, but the inner walls are beautifully decorated with colorful frescoes. You can see a lot of them. And it is, again, um, Art Chala temple, Bengali hut style temple. And the, it is flanked by the Ramachandra temple and uh, the Krishna Chandra temple on its two sides. 
Now coming to the Ramachandra temple, having very intricate terracotta works, very intricate terracotta panels. And these uh, panels have depicted a lot of scenes from the day-to-day -day life, from um, the Krishna Leela, from Merin Voyage, as you can see, I have put in over here, from um, the Krishna Leela panel. So this is again the Eka Ratna style of temple, one pinnacle, and uh, constructed in the late 18th century by the king of uh, Sherafuli, Harish Chandra Roy. Now coming to the Krishna Chandra temple again, these all four temples, they are connected by narrow arched pass passageways. Okay, so all these are residing in one particular temple complex. Again, this is uh, protected by our ASI and it follows that the Akchala form uh, of architecture as well. Now coming to the uh, analysis of this particular region. Now the strengths that we have seen over here are the cultural resources and the heritage monuments of this region. Again, certain small cotton in industries are also there. Uh, what the main weakness of this region is that the lack of infrastructure and the lack of awareness. So people are not much aware about this, even though it is very much protected by the ASI. The normal travelers or the tourists, they are not very much aware about it. Again, there is huge uh, opportunity for development of cultural tourism. And uh, there is obviously scope for market development. And that will lead to the socioeconomic development of the region. And if uh, we are unable to provide the sustainable development of that particular region, then definitely there are uh, threats pertaining to this that is re the loss of the cultural resources or you know loss of potential tourism opportunity because uh, when we have visited there we found that it is basically few tourists in and around that area who are visiting in that particular place and uh, just like if you compare because m most of us are aware about Bishnupur heritage sites and it is very commonly visited, even Shantiniketan commonly visited. When you think about Bengal, we always think about Shantiniketan, we think about Bishnupur, but these regions are not much highlighted. Again, um, so basically if we talk about the cultural uh, heritage landscape, the tangible, the intangible uh, elements, we can categorize, we have seen scholars categorizing it, that existed, not existed, and existed, but they have been destroyed. And there are certain ways we can do certain uh, you know, modifications to these uh, particular uh, monuments so that uh, it will be an aid towards developing heritage tourism. So we have put in the uh, factors like addition, continuation, customization, transformation, and repair and maintenance, okay? So these are the categories of changes which can be done to the monument, again, for keeping in mind the sustainable development of that particular region. Now, what is the need? for developing sustainable tourism strategies. Why am I talking about the fact that it has to be a holistic uh, approach and we need people from different areas of uh, uh, you know, um, academics as well as uh, practitioners? So because basically you can see that um, nowadays it is very uh, common that uh, these heritages are neglected, these are um, you know, either protected by ASI or the state directorate or personally maintained. But most of such local heritages are lost because there is no funding, there is no way of maintaining those particular uh, sites. So definitely if we have a particular uh, sustainable tourism plan and strategies for that, the, we can put forward to certain other aspects uh, for funding which uh, even um, uh, certain other areas where we have seen certain things have happened. I'll come to that just before the last slide. So certain aspects we need to understand that 
what are the key inputs for the tourism business if I happen to choose this particular area? Nature conservation of the arts and cultural activities, okay, that should be considered. So these are vital inputs for strategy making. It, it cannot be a common strategy for all the regions or all the heritages. It has to be a regional approach with regional variations. So mm, uh, what we see is the we have got certain uh, studies which were carried out by uh, Bernard Lane in 1994 and it was uh, the Berwick Borough Council so he had developed a particular uh, sustainable tourism strategies but again um, Exactly, I think in uh, later on in the same panel, uh, my senior colleague Dr. Carmen would be also highlighting the fact that we cannot just do control uh, C and control V, that means copy and paste, we cannot do that. So what we need to do is we need to understand its importance, we need to understand the potentialities, the strengths, the weaknesses that we have for our region and then we can propose the development of the strategy. So that's why developing technological competitiveness, highlighting the second point that is regional analysis, um, identification of areas tourism uh, capacity and its um, ability to uh, sustain. Again community involvement very important for that. Analysis of the visitors' carrying capacity, these have to be taken into consideration while formulating the strategies. Market survey, again, training program for the local people, because local people are aware of certain myths and the local stories, and which are day by day uh, losing its essence, and uh, they are also not keeping the values because they are not understanding what to do with it, so people are no longer uh, trying to stick to it. Again, awareness program, local groups to monitor it. So these are the important uh, strategy formulation inputs that we need to consider. And certain interesting facts, as I have mentioned, like the corporate social responsibility may be helpful for this because I happened to visit uh, the places and I had my senior colleague, Dr. Bhattacharya, he also told me that NTPC had actually taken this initiative under their CSR, the Corporate Social Responsibility Program, to uh, conserve this uh, group of monuments in Orissa. So basically there are uh, th there is a gap between the corporates and uh, the people who are the guardians of the heritage monuments. So I propose to bridge the gap if possible through the research and not only through the research but taking it to the next level that it can be practical. So if through this academic experience changes, I can, uh, as a person from management aspect, evaluate that particular heritage monument and promote it. Definitely, that's the key word. I can market it or promote it to the company so that they take the initiative to uh, spend the money, and uh, although they have, and they have a particular category of corporate social responsibility, which most of you are aware as per Companies Act 2013, so the companies are supposed to pay a percentage of their income, and they, are spent, they sh should spend it on so society's development, and that particular money can be you know properly utilized for heritage preservation and also we have seen Tata group taking initiative for the sustainability of the intangible cultural heritage of the Santhal community in uh, Jharkhand so they have developed a similar tribal center so as a part of this in, uh, CSR initiative so Keeping these uh, aspects in mind, yes, I'll just draw the conclusion. Um, heritage uh, tourism has uh, got great potentials, particularly in Guptipara, as I have witnessed myself. And uh, definitely in future, we have uh, plans to work out how best we can implement these strategies. Even uh, we are planning as a part of our uh, society, uh, I am 
trying to bridge this gap with the research and certain projects involving the wider community as I have mentioned where I would like to uh, you know invite and involve uh, my students who are from the management and definitely students who are from the engineering background so that they can also get the feel of uh, applying their knowledge to uh, pr the preservation and the sustainable development of uh, these local heritages. So lastly, I would say that this could also promote the startups in this regions and definitely identify the gap as I was highlighting what is needed and what is available in the society. And this will lead to the economic and the social development, definitely uh, paving the way for sustainable development. And this was a picture of the heritage walk that we had in this Hooghly region. But the time was short, so I could not manage to fit in certain other very interesting heritage sites which we have visited as a part of this heritage walk. Maybe sometime later we can arrange for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Many thanks, uh, Asmita, madam. I mean, in fact, uh, before we go for the next lecture, uh, I must tell you one thing. We uh, historians, archaeologists, uh, conservationists, all the time we use the uh, term management. We do realize many a times the management professionals are not with us. Because if you talk about, we talk about the conservation management, archaeological heritage resource management, all these management courses are not there in our country except probably one place uh, in Ahmedabad that recently opened. And there's a high time that management professionals, they need to join, then uh, they should join the hands of, uh, with the archaeologists, conservationists, or we cannot disintegrate, you know, separate your tourism, conservation or uh, archaeology history separately. I mean, it has to be seen in a very comprehensive manner. Definitely. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we get connected. Thank you. Hello. I can speak from here? Yeah. Hello, Professor Sergio. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Welcome. Thank you so much yeah. for the invitation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we invite you for this uh, session, this afternoon session, and uh, delegates is Professor Segu, uh, if I'm not pronouncing wrongly, Mustagia, something like that. Mustiata. Okay. Meaning mustache. Thank okay. you. Uh, he's a professor in history and geography faculty, uh, and uh, Kriyenga State University, Republic of Moldova. And he will be speaking on Soroka medieval castle, uh, probably a uh, castle, its uh, geographical implications and other things, if I'm not wrong, something like that. So without any waste of time, I would request you, you have got something like uh, 15, 17 minutes, if you can talk to us. Over to Professor Segio. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah. dear colleagues. Uh, good afternoon for you, uh, even though it's morning. So, good afternoon for everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, during following minutes, I would like to share my experience working on Soroka Medieval Castle, uh, which is quite a uh, uh, known uh, site in Moldova, but not just in Moldova, let's say in Eastern Europe. Um, it's coming from the late medieval time, but because it's very well preserved since uh, 16th century, uh, it's well known and quite visited uh, by different tourists. Uh, and uh, uh, so, let me know if my presentation is visible for you. Yeah, everything is okay. It's visible. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Let's go through. So uh, this is uh, uh, on pardon? the uh, northeastern border of Moldova. Uh, Soroka is placed in a small pretty? city. Uh, Professor Segio, your presentation yeah. is not visible. Sorry? Your presentation is not visible. 
is not visible no you have got a powerpoint yes it yeah. is a powerpoint i try to share the presentation yeah, it is a, it is visible it. or not no not yet not yet okay let's try again yeah uh, it has come you'll have to go to the full page sorry yeah, yeah it's again. coming it's coming yeah uh, now mm, yes. yes you make yes full screen okay good screen. thank you john um so soroka medieval fortress it look like this actually in moldova it's called fortress but because of the size uh, the scholars are debating the question how to uh, to name uh, this uh, uh, culture site because uh, it's very small just professor, 30 meters diameter professor sergio would you please make it full screen that would be better Sorry, would you make it full screen? Ah, uh, full screen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Of course. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hopefully now it works. Yeah. 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 Good. So this is the medieval uh, castle in Moldova. So uh, uh, we did some pictures from the top uh, of the area. You could imagine how it, it looks like. And um, uh, it's known from medieval time because it was placed on the eastern border of medieval Moldova. And it was many times attacked by the Cossacks, by the Polish army, by the Tatars, by the uh, Turkish army, so Ottoman Empire army. So it's quite known area since 15th century. But uh, 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 let's say like this, the, the, the castle itself, uh, it's known from the beginning of 16th century. We don't know exactly from the written sources when it was built, but probably at the beginning of uh, 16th century, it was already sent up because we uh, have some mentions that um, this place uh, was one important uh, custom and military fort on the river Dnestr on the eastern border of Moldova. So we try to collect various maps and plans and try to understand the development of this site along the history, along the 15th, 16th and 17th century. So you could see a Russian plan from the 18th century. We don't know exactly if this additional, let's say, fortification existed. We did some excavation, but we couldn't find the remains. We're trying to find this uh, church, but also we didn't find the remains in the park area. So it's known that the fortress is here and it's still existing, but the surrounding area is not so well uh, uh, studied. And uh, that's why a um, few years ago, it was a European Union supported project. Uh, it's a cross-border project between Moldova, Ukraine and Romania. And Soroka was part of this uh, uh, important project to rehabilitate. Uh, just a few slides about the role and importance of Soroka in our, uh, let's say, Moldovan society. You could see Soroka fortress on the Moldovan currency, on Moldovan lay. It's placed so on the central place. Uh, and then we have some uh, uh, anniversary coins issued by the National Bank during the last years of some historic events. So, uh, and also on the, our ID cards, uh, the back side, you could see the ground also in Soroka Fortress. So you could understand that Soroka is an important uh, historic place for Moldovan citizens, and actually it's everywhere. Uh, so a lot of cultural events are uh, taking place before and now also around the fortress, or sometimes inside, doing some musical uh, festivals uh, of the traditional music. And um, concerning the archaeological excavations, we have a couple of uh, excavations during the Soviet time in 1950s and then in 1960s because it was a huge project to rehabilitate the fortress. And that's why archaeologists from the uh, uh, Institute of Archaeology did some excavation inside and just very small outside of the fortress. And now, according to the new project, um, the architect proposed various issues to rehabilitate and to do some constructions. They didn't succeed to promote this idea to rebuild the infrastructure inside, but they did some uh, work around the fortress just to preserve and to conserve, let's say, the towers, which were uh, a little bit affected by the time and also some, some uh, other issues. So we did 
some excavations, but also non-invasive uh, methods. We used uh, uh, geophysics and also we used the maps to try to understand the uh, surrounding area, also to try to answer many questions concerning the chronology and also the cultural developments of the area. You could see different tools which we used, GPR, GPS, magnetometry, uh, to try to understand the development in the area, which was not so easy because um, during the Second World War and immediately after after Second World War, the area was totally rebuilt and replaced uh, the buildings, and they developed a park around without, without any documentation. So we tried to find in archives some documents, but we couldn't find something. So uh, that's why you use different tools to understand uh, the area around the fortress. And uh, sometimes we discovered some, some important uh, issues, but in other cases, not so well. Uh, so you could see uh, our team, which is working uh, with uh, magnetometry around, and also our architecture team working together. So we try to develop a cross-border project, inviting colleagues from Romania, from uh, uh, Germany, and uh, of course, together with Moldovan scholars to try to do excavations, but also interpretation of the results. That's why we, try to bring together scholars who are uh, experienced in this area of, let's say, mid late medieval constructions, but also infrastructure around. But also our, uh, let's say, uh, project, archaeological projects was involving our students from the faculty during the summer internship, uh, students who are, uh, have to do the, the archaeological practicum and they have to be trained in the real practical work by using different tools, excavating, but also using these uh, important tools. So uh, also we try to understand the soil better uh, to, to do some analysis uh, and to try to work with the stratigraphy uh, using these tools of uh, pedology. Um, and we invited colleagues from the uh, soil department uh, from Romania also, uh, and they also help us to understand how the, the, the soil around the fortress uh, and the stratigraphy uh, was developed along the centuries. And we published the result in a special, let's say, volume. But also to do the excavation inside of the fortress because with different casemats or including inside of the tower, it was very difficult because it's a small area and uh, we tried to, to work. You could see uh, how to, to go uh, down from the top of the tower to the, the base of the tower and we ask fire department to help us to, to have these steps and to, to just to uh, issue the, the access and to do excavation inside of the towers because as we know from previous excavations uh, before the, the uh, stone fortress it was the wooden fortress and we try to look and to find the remains and to understand better the, the previous let's say wooden fortress and we succeed and we discovered also architecture ask us to do some excavation in front of the, the at the main entrance of the fortress but was not so easy because it was already let's say asphalt and it was not so uh, uh, it was very difficult for us that's why we invited people from the, the road department from the city and they helped us to cut the asphalt and also to do the excavation in front at the main entrance but also it was very successful because we discovered the different stuff and artifacts so you could see how it was the work in progress which was not so easy but it was very useful to do the excavations around the, the, the castle to understand the base and the structure how deep it is and also to answer to many questions um, for us, it was important to understand the construction technology and uh, uh, contain of the mortar. That's why we try to bring some samples, uh, samples and we ask uh, some alpinists from the, from the city to help us to, to go from the top of the, the uh, fortress to the down and to try to collect the samples and then to do the analysis in the lab to understand the contain uh, of the mortar, which they used during the, the, let's say, beginning of 16th century. And this is exactly of the picture, the result of excavation from the bottom. Um, and we discovered remains of the previous uh, fortifications uh, lines before the stone fortress was done at the beginning of 16th, 16th century. Very important discoveries were coins, as usually it is in the archaeological um, surveys. And we discovered, of course, uh, gun balls, which are important, a lot of them, which is meaning that uh, the fortress itself was attacked periodically by Tatars, by Cossacks, and we could corroborate uh, of the written sources. But the coins um, are very important for us because we discovered at different uh, uh, stratigraphic points, and uh, they uh, help us to understand and to interpret the chronology of the fortress. So the base of the fortress, according to the coins, it was done at the beginning of 16th century, and we 
we have some coins from uh, uh, Moldovan rulers uh, from this period of time, but also from the uh, coins uh, from Ottoman Empire, from Russia, and from Polish area too. So as a result of the, this conservation project, uh, the fortress, the cover of the fortress looks like this. So it, it was a long debate to do like this or not. Uh, we didn't support, but anyway, they succeed to do. Uh, and I will explain the, uh, why they did. So we also tried to uh, establish cooperation of mass media and to present the results periodically uh, for the citizens uh, and also our students uh, reading the news about our excavations, which is very important when we have this, uh, let's say, feedback from the journalists which are working together. Uh, but also results and uh, discoveries and artifacts uh, which we um, discovered there and also tried to analyze together with the students, but also inviting people. You could see at the end some certificates of participation of the students, but also uh, the scholars who have been involved, and also um, the volume of the conference, which we published after um, an international conference, bringing scholars uh, specialized on these fortifications uh, from the Eastern Europe. Um, we try to do and uh, to, to find anal analogies. Uh, different people try to compare uh, Soroka Castle with Del Monte, which is not so uh, good comparison because you, you could see Del Monte is totally different. Yes, maybe by, by, the, uh, by the structure, but uh, architecture is totally different. And we found another uh, appropriate, let's say, uh, analogy in Scotland, uh, Rotsay Castle, which is earlier than, than Soroka Castle, but by the structure, by the plan, it's very appropriate that you could see the circular and also the bastions around and the main entrance like we have in Soroka. So you could see like this. And also, if we'll compare the plan, Soroka is much better, but it's later one, a couple of centuries later. How they, uh, who was the architecture, how they uh, find the, the, the form and the, the plan of the fortress, we cannot say today, but you could see it's appropriate to Rotsay Castle from 11th, 12th century from Scotland. So comparatively with this, so you could see the images from Scotland and also from Soroka. Uh, that's the wooden uh, cover which they did today. Uh, it was to protect uh, because it's uh, humidity and the inside it's a huge problem and they try to develop this uh, cover according to the medieval tradition uh, on churches, on monasteries, but it's not the case in military and the, uh, uh, cast, uh, this custom, of, let's say, fort. Uh, that architecture proposed to do like this, and now it's looked like, like this. So that's why uh, it's better that they preserve uh, against the ray uh, and to protect the water, but it's another problem because the water is coming from the, from the down, not just from the top. Um, so you could see how it was before and how it is today. And uh, also a good journalist from, from the area tried to bring, to put together uh, today picture and the previous picture and to compare how it was before and how it's the relation between um, past and present and how it is today. But um, it's very attractive. Uh, after um, 2015, when the fortress was reopened for the public, the number of visitors increased a lot excepting last year of course because of the pandemic uh, situation but the fortress itself is very visible and many thousands of people are coming around the year to visit this fortress to visit the city itself because it's on the border uh, eastern border of moldova but also it's a river and it's not nice landscape and also uh, the administration tried to um, build some stuff around the fortress in this park area and for the local inhabitants also it's very important you could see for the wedding part is that they play something in the park which which becoming more and more attractive so um, you could see how the built heritage in a small city um, it's important for the community and also it's becoming more and more sustainable for the future development because bringing people around the, the, the Moldova and also around the Europe coming to visit Soroka. Soroka is attractive not just because of the fortress. We have a huge gypsy com uh, community, Roma community there, and it's specific one. They have a huge uh, area in the th city, very well developed with the palaces, and that's why people are coming to Soroka to visit and to see how the Roma people are living today in this part of the world. But anyway, Soroka remain an attractive point, an important monument, historic monument for Moldova, from many points of view, and of course from this historic uh, heritage as an uh, uh, attractive, uh, but also an important for the Moldovan national values. So thank you so much, and I will be glad to answer to your questions. Yeah.
thank you, Professor Segu. Uh, you have finished it on time. And uh, we hope that you will continue with us till all the lectures get over. And after the end of the session, we'll have some question and answers. Huh? Oh, yeah. It's so, yeah. questions, please. Uh, uh, no, uh, we cannot hear. Okay. Professor Basu, could you? Uh, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, thank you very much, Professor Saigu, for your excellent talk. And uh, we'll have the question and answer session at the end of the session, after all the lectures are over. So, okay, good. Yeah. If you can continue with us, that will be better. You yeah, can yeah. listen I to was others. Yeah. yeah. Now I invite uh, Professor uh, Eduardo Badin. And he is a supervisor, uh, Glen Pinan Monument, National Trust for Scotland. And he will be speaking on compatible tourism in COVID Scotland during COVID-19. Compatible uh, yes. tourism. Hi. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm just going to uh, pick up, uh, bring up the presentation. Uh, do you have a presentation? Yes, I do have a presentation. I'm just trying to uh, bring yeah. it up on uh, Zoom. Yeah, you'll have to share it. Mm. You are on Zoom. We are also on Zoom. Yeah. Google. Sorry, Google me. Sorry, yeah, I, Google I apologize. Me. So, uh, okay. So at the bottom of the screen, you will find that uh, yeah. share. Right. Can you see no, the No, no, that's the present now. Present now. Yes. And you click on that present now. We can see, sir. Yeah. So, it has come. Yeah. Are you? Are you? Yeah, yeah. I cannot see. No, it has I come. I can't see anymore, so I'll have to trust that you can see the presentation. Yes, we can see now. Perfect. Right. So thank you very much, everyone, for having me and. Uh, Professor, um, uh, I don't want to pronounce the name wrong, Druga, for inviting me. And uh, I'm truly honored. And it's a great thing that we can do conferences again, even though if it is uh, remotely. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the effects of the pandemic in Scotland and the tourism. Um, just to clarify, I couldn't, I can't provide up-to-date information on certain area in certain areas because I'm on Forlo. That means that I can't have access to all the details that I was meant to uh, within the trust. So I do apologize if some figures are not as accurate as they should have been. So, um, to begin with, when you come to Scotland, you usually come for four reasons. The the four reasons are visiting castles. Over 5 million people come and view, uh, visit the castles in Scotland to play golf, to visit Loch Ness area because it became famous due to the alleged monster that lives uh, in the waters of Loch Ness. And they built an entire experience for visitors uh, based on that. And to uh, visit distilleries where whiskey is produced and as you can see, uh, figures are quite important. Pre-pandemic, people that visited Loch Ness area, which is a lake, realistically, we're talking about a lake, and they built an entire store around it. It was 325,000 in 2019. Um, that generated 40 million pounds just in that area for the, in, uh, for the local businesses. And then we have uh, something like 2.2 million uh, visitors come in in um, in Scotland to visit distilleries, and that generated in 2019 six, over 60 million pounds. So you understand it's a very important market. But 30% of these visitors that came to Scotland, they were foreigners, and by foreigner means anyone outside from UK. And of these uh, visitors, a lot of them were Americans. But I'll get to that in a moment. Now, these are the attractions that you that are normally visited when you first come to Scotland or by people returning to Scotland. And as you can see, there is a castle at the very top, Edinburgh Castle, 
And then as uh, a museum, we have the National Museum of Scotland. That's one of the free, free of charge exhibitions that you have. Um, the play, the monument I work at, Glenfinnan Monument, it's one of the top visited uh, properties. Again, these informations are from 2017, but I can tell you that in 2019, just before the pandemic, Glenfinnan re uh, uh, reached over 500,000 visitors in one year. After the pandemic, when we reopened, we managed only to have 66,000 visitors in one year. So you, you already started to feel what a major impact the pandemic had. Um, this is to give you an idea of the number of, uh, the percentages of visitors and how the demographics work. And as you can see, the American market is very important for Scotland. Like, uh, alongside with German market, they are the most important one. And if you remove 2.7 million visitors from the five and a half that came to Scotland in 2019, and this is a data based on 2016 information, so you need to probably uh, add a bit more visitors on these numbers. You understand that we are removing a lot, a lot of visitors and potential income generation for heritage sector. Um, what can they do in Scotland is to rely on domestic visitors, which are still very important. We look, in 2016, we were looking at uh, 11 million and a half. Now, that's a market that is underestimated sometimes. But again, domestic visitors, they do include um, anyone from UK, which means Northern Ireland, Wales, England, as well as Scotland. Now, we'd, we are probably going to go back into a tire system, which means that people are allowed to travel only within uh, areas that have the same level of uh, threat in, according to the COVID-19 pandemic, which means that a lot of the domestic visitors from England most likely will not be able to travel anytime soon once the lockdown is lifted in UK. So again, the visitor attractions in Scotland need to carefully plan how to capture the very local audience in order to be able to survive if they decide to reopen. Now, this is to give you uh, an, an idea of the, con the economic contribution uh, or in Scotland of visitors. So out of all the visitors that came in 2016, which we there were 14 mil over 14 millions, the tourism ministry generated 4.8 billion pounds. Now that's a considerable amount of money. We're talking about 200,000 people employed in the leisure sector in Scotland. That, to give you a comparison, Scotland uh, inhabitants are 5.5 million, given or taken. So a lot of people work, almost 5% of the population works in, in the leisure industry. And then you need to consider the whiskey industry, which is another 60,000 people working. So you get to over 300,000 people working in something related to tourism. And then of all of this money generated, you have to re reduce 30%. So what you see on the top right of the slide, in the chart on the top right, the orange part of the column, that's the income generated by uh, international tourists or anyone who's not from UK. And now every business needs to operate without that. And it's most likely that we'll not see international travel uh, or tourism resume to pre-pandemic pre standard for at least another year, a year and a half. So we need to learn how to live without that income. Now, the National Trust for Scotland, just to give you a, a brief overview, look after 97 property, historic properties, and then it's got uh, um, um, natural reserve, uh, looking after the coastlines and archaeological sites. And on the left, um, you can see how the income generation expenditures uh, were going from 2017 up to 2020. Now, for many years, the charity was operating in a deficit. Only last year, actually, and I just now, two years ago, it managed to spend less than what it was generating. That changed in 2020, because with the property closed, we had basically 
income generation racing. Um, I wanted to give you an idea, just to break down the expenses. So this is what the National Trust spends on charitable activities, which means anything going from conservation to paying for member of staff looking after the properties and welcoming visitors. So that's the orange part. Other activities could be emergencies and um, investments to protect uh, heritage. And then raising funds, it's basically doing PR to support the trust in raising money through legacies and uh, online campaigns, uh, TV adverts, and all of that. This is how they generate the income. So we have big, big, important part played by uh, donation and legacies, as you can see from the blue uh, part of the chart. You have almost a third generated by that. You then have charitable activities and trading activities. They are uh, a mix of admission income, uh, when you pay a ticket or you become a member, or um, the trading activities, the secondary spending, so like the catering, uh, when you go into a shop, in a gift shop in a museum, when you buy a poster or a book, that's where you go, where the money that you donate to the charity will go. And then there is money coming from investment and other financial support. Now, I decided to use the black here to show what's starting to disappear. We have lost the charitable activities because the properties are closed. And then we lost the trading activities because we couldn't trade because it was no longer safe. So we lost retail income, catering income, function and events income. So like weddings that were happening in Castle could no longer happen. That means that the trust lost 25 to 26 millions. We went down in digital numbers by 70% in 2020. Um, almost 400 pe uh, 300 employees were made redundant. And during the pandemic, uh, the rescue plan for the trust uh, declared that 50 property had to be mothballed, which means kept alive, but close to the public for health and safety reason, and because there was not enough staff anymore to open them up. So you understand that 97 properties, half of them had to stay closed temporarily until we were able to raise enough money to protect them and reopen them to the public. That's a major impact. Sorry, I'm trying to move the presentation. Um, there we go. So how can, uh, how can they uh, sort of recover from this uh, catastrophe? Because it was a major challenge for everyone. Um, compatible tourism, Although it was not applied in this case, you can you you may be able to see after this presentation that there are some similarities, and it is based on a very wise local site management. So knowing very well the geography of all the of all the properties within the trust, the infrastructure available. Now this is a challenging pandemic situation because you can't really use public transport or you don't feel comfortable using them. Mass tourism. It's sort of disappearing, but mass tourism, it's not having 5 million people going to just one place. Mass tourism is having a lot of people in the order of thousands going to a particular site over a short amount of period. And then we still see that because at Glenfinnan, we had an average of 800 to 1,000 people a day after we reopened in September. Now, I... I know that the previous year we were talking about two to three thousand people a day, but in a sense, that's still quite a large amount of visitors for a small area. And then local legislation can support you by uh, giving you the right information and input to develop uh, uh, the area your monument or your museum is and link to the community, because you need to always manage to work uh, very well with the communities. Now, this is a, a bit more uh, detailed um, theme of the compatible tourism, but what's important is the top right. Now, if you want compatible tourism to work, you need to have a network of sites and you need to have a major site that is going to be a catalyst to the tourism and then being able to redirect it to minor uh, properties. Minor properties are not less important than a major one. It just the um, PR and the interest around them, it's not strong enough yet. But the major sites works for them because it will 
get the people there and then move them to another site through communication and uh, marketing. Now, Glen Finan was doing that for other properties in the northeast uh, of Scotland. So we are located on the northwest. When people were coming to visit us, we would mention and explain how many properties they could see on the other coast. Not all of them will probably go, uh, would have probably gone there, but it was still part of the core job of compatible tourism. It is done by the member of staff and volunteers on site. And this is how it should work. Um, we will have a major site that it's functioning as the catalyst, and then you have satellite sites, minor ones, that are linked to that one through marketing and advertising, local transport, and a reasonable distance. Now, if you look at Scotland, Scotland is not that massive. You could go from the west coast to the east coast in three hours. So theoretically, you could visit any site, provided that you are interested in doing so. So you have train transport, you have buses going east to west and north to south. You could drive on motorways. So in all honesty, it is, it is possible to have three or four major sites in the trust redirecting mass the, to the masses of tourists, minor ones nearby, by nearby I say one to three hours away from the first site. Now these are all the sites that you can see in Scotland managed by the National Trust for Scotland. Of all of these, I'm just going to present you the case of the Northeast briefly. Um, these are all the sites that you could have visited up to December 2019 before the pandemic. Now. After the pandemic in September, when we reopened, these were the red dots where the sites reopened, less than a half. The issue that I saw in this in that location, um, the, they reopened sites very close to each other in near to Aberdeen. Uh, that was Crathers Castle and Drum Castle. But then they left a big gap in the middle. Now, as I said, you could travel easily between uh, the Culloden, which is the one on the top left uh, dot, um, or Brody Castle, the one just above Culloden on the right. Um, but because they are in different tiers, they are different counties, you actually were not a lot, no longer allowed to travel between the county that had Culloden and Brody Castle on the left and the properties in Aberdeenshire. So what I would have suggested to the Trust was actually to think about opening one of the properties to sort of move the audience away from two properties very close to each other and give also different experience because they reopen in the northeast a visitor center which you could only visit at one point if you were part of the same uh, if you lived in the county and a castle and in Aberdeenshire which is the area on the right towards the sea they reopened two castles and a garden, and they left closed all the, the historical houses, which would have provided them with a different uh, atmosphere to the visitor. It would have been a completely different. And also, they missed on opportunities because castles, uh, they have uh, health safety regulation the issues with COVID-19. You can't have that many people coming in. You can't have any more, st any, uh, more stuff like you used to. So it was a lot of work to do. And although the gen income generation was sufficient to keep them open, a lot of potential was missed because they didn't take the risk of opening such, such a, a property like Haddock House. Um, so I just wanted to carry on a little bit longer, but not too much. The key facts of the um, of these is that 50 properties out of 97 were reopened between August and December. The income generation was in line with the domestic only audience. It wasn't as exceptional as it was before, but it was still good. The National Trust managed to save 200 jobs because it got support from uh, the government, the Scottish government, and it also had support from donations. Uh, during the summer, there was a massive campaign called Save, uh, save Our Scotland, then raised over three million pounds. And a lot of people decided to uh, take up uh, the call and went on fundraising for the National Trust for Scotland. And there were people walking around Scotland, cycling around Scotland. I myself did a walk of 500 miles to support and raise awareness uh, around properties. Um, 
And the number of visitors uh, from a domestic point of view stayed in line with the previous years. They were declining, but not so much. And because of the fundraising campaigns, as I said, um, the properties and hotels were able, they were able to save. Some of the issues that the uh, reopening of the property was based on 2019-2020 figures, which meant that uh, Culloden, which had uh, 250,000 visitors uh, in that year, it couldn't get the same number of visitors because it was based 60% on international tourists. They couldn't come. So Culloden location, it's very close to a major cruise, uh, cruise port. Now, the cruise ship industry was it's non-existent at the moment, so they missed that completely. By, not, by Americans, let's say, Americans not coming, which was a huge part of the international uh, tourist market, demographics, the spend per head was lowered. Uh, on average, uh, Americans were spending 20 to 30 pounds per person. The average spend for an uh, English person, a uh, um, British person, uh, was five to ten pounds and sometimes even lower depending on the site so you you already see the consequences of not having international tourists and the local transport was also affected because people didn't feel comfortable taking them and opening size sites that are basically too close and leaving large areas without any site meant that some places were um, not able to provide any um, uh, heritage uh, um, attractions and this is uh, the graph is, uh, just to give you the idea of number of visitors we go from the dark blue is the 2019 and the light blue is the 2020 the number of visitors dropped radically we're going from 220,000 uh, 20, in Culloden 2019 to just 20,000 uh, Glenfin and half of a million to 66,000 drum castle from 45, 50,000 to just 10,000. And Crawford, you're going from 150,000 to just above 35,000. You, you see the impact of this pandemic. A lot of people are not coming because they cannot travel. A lot of people cannot even go from Edinburgh to Aberdeen, which is only an hour and two hours away. So we need to understand that if we want to survive in this pandemic, we need to look into uh, getting the local people in and to reopen strategically located properties. In, uh, in um, one. Sorry, I'm just trying to move again. The, I'm almost done. Here we go. So the income generation is in line with the uh, decline of visitor numbers. As you can see, 2019, very strong figures, and that 2020, they decreased radically. And it's basically, if you had less people coming through, you will also have an income generation, a lower income generation. Now that, the expenditures were also reduced because a lot of properties had, were basically uh, with skeleton staff. So instead of having 10 members of staff to deal with visitors because the demand was lower, you were at two or three. So that, that was a way to sort of balance out the lost income generation. Um, this is in the northeast. So we have Haddo House that was uh, one of the pro a property that I used to work. We had 30,000 visitors uh, in 2019 and then merely few thousand in 2020 between the time that we were open in January, February, and then when we closed. And the country park, which is just, outside, it's owned by the council, but it's part of the sort of heritage of Haddo House. Um, they never stopped going there because people were allowed to go out for training and there was an opportunity for them to go there. So the numbers stayed similar between what, the 2019 and 2020. What's important is that the income generated by the historical house and its uh, secondary spending uh, areas like retail and catering basically dropped and then it stopped. And as for now, as of now, it's still closed. It closed on the 20th of March last year and it has not reopened. And the, the plan is to reopen it potentially in the summer or next year. Now, next door to our house, there is an independent cafe, Mrs. Smith. Um, it was in direct competition with the catering offer of the National Trust, but because there were 200,000 people coming every year, there was sufficient, there was a big audience for to serve both cafes. Now, the first, the independent cafe, yes, saw a, a slight drop in income generation because it went from 75,000 roughly pounds a year 
to 70,000. But it only dropped minimally because it took out all the missed um, market that the National Trust was not able to cope with or to welcome because the property was closed and the cafe was closed. So it benefited the local uh, cafe and we can see that the trust could have gained something by reopening at least a part of the branch. Uh, Dr. Biden, one minute more. And uh, these are the conclusions. So I got to the end and it can work uh, compatible tourism. It's not a problem, um, but we do need to uh, consider how we are reopening and why we're reopening certain sites. We can't be basing our deductions and assumptions on figures that are no longer possible. And the income generation through this reopening and a fa phased reopen can work and can be sufficient to support our charity work, but it has to be carefully managed. And as I said, we need to, to choose carefully the properties that we reopen. We, we cannot assume that because a property had half of a million visitors two years ago, they, they will come again this year or the year after, because we are not dealing with the same uh, tourism. It's a completely demographic, it's a completely different uh, environment we are in at the moment. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I hope uh, I'm, it was clear enough what I was trying to prove. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bedin. It was a wonderful talk, in fact. You know, after a long yeah. time, coming out of, almost coming out of COVID-19 and listening about the heritage situation then. Anyway. Well, uh, we're not out yet, yeah. I'm afraid. We're still in lockdown in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the, the next speaker is Dr. John Karaman. He's a senior lecturer in Heritage Valuation, Iron Breeze International Institute for Cultural Heritage, University of Birmingham. He will be talking about uh, on managing the built heritage and international perspective. Uh, Dr. Karaman. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in, in this event. I managed to catch the uh, the opening ceremony and a little bit of yesterday, um, but the timing is obviously a little bit awkward from, from here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Asu particularly because she's going to manage my slides for me, so thank you very much. I'm the least technological person in the world. So, um, so the main point of this paper is simply that designing a system for managing the built heritage of any part of the world, it's imperative to ensure that the system conforms with expectations and understandings of the world in that particular context. If the system doesn't conform to the conventional modes of behaviour and thinking of those who inhabit the area where the system is to be applied, it simply won't work. The result will be no effective management of the heritage to its design to protect and conserve for the future. It doesn't actually matter if the system is different or similar to that from which it is in operation somewhere else. There are absolute rights and wrongs in this, simply different ways of doing it. And so there's no objective criterion that is universally applicable, um, but how well it works to achieve what you want to achieve in terms of what you consider your built heritage to be and how best to persuade people to act in accordance with what you want. A key aspect is the role of various agents in heritage management, those deriving their authority as state bodies or those acting in a more private capacity. Depending on the system in place, these will be accorded more decision powers and more flexibility of action. As with other aspects of heritage management, there is no universally applicable standard practice shared by all countries. Um, a little while ago, I carried out a quick survey of 22 countries from every continent. About half of them limited ownership of cultural heritage to the state alone, while the remaining 11 allowed some measure of private ownership, some a lot, some just uh, more limited. The degree of state control also varied across the 22 countries, but in those cases where the state was the automatic sole owner, laws were more restrictive and authority reserved for state agencies, thus limiting the capacity for private initiative. Sanctions for breach of regulations also vary depending upon where the greater responsibility is deemed to lie. There are several ways in which what counts as heritage can be defined for purposes of its management. Um, 
lawyers call these enumeration, categorization, and classification. Enumeration is a list of kinds of material to be covered walls, palaces, churches, archaeological sites, things like that. And that's the way they do it in the USA. Categorization is a loose approach by a broad description of types of material and places of architectural interest or structures of a particular age is provided into which a range of particular objects may fall. And it's the way we do it in the UK. By contrast with both, designation is not concerned with the form of the object, but with actions taken towards it. In a designation system, only those individual structures officially recognised and designated as heritage by a responsible authority, usually a government official, can be granted protection. And these differences represent contrasting approaches to how to treat the cultural heritage. Where only designated material is covered by law, the emphasis is placed upon the relevant authority in its decisions. Where material is enumerated, anything included in the list is automatically covered, removing any decision powers from agencies. Under schemes of categorization, a measure of interpretation is required, placing some, but not all, focus on agencies. An enumerative scheme includes of the kinds of materials and places constituting the heritage. By its nature, anything not listed is excluded. A scheme of categorization has a greater capacity for the inclusion of new types of material, especially if the categories are drawn not on the basis of physical form or attributes, such as age, but on value ascriptions, such as of architectural, archaeological, religious, or interest or importance. Paradoxically, the greatest flexibility may exist under a scheme of designation, so long as the capacity to designate is drawn quite widely. It can be limited by uh, the things, and then it's significantly less able to include new types of material when they become recognised as heritage. Depending on the system of identifying heritage operation, there will be a greater or lesser role for non-governmental and private organisations. And can we have the next slide, please? Sorry, second slide. That's the one. Yeah, thank you. While a distinction between the state and civil society is a well-established model, the agents that inhabit each are not quite so easily identified. There are those that are civil, civil in nature, operating entirely independently of government, which nonetheless provide services and perform functions on behalf of the state, and may be at least partially funded out of taxation. So when we speak of private initiatives in relation to heritage, we need to be clear what exactly we are talking about. Those who engage with heritage for the wider public good are also public institutions, but not necessarily agents of the state. So there is, I think, a clear distinction to be drawn between community and voluntary engagement with heritage and the role of commercial organisations. These are not the same thing and operate very differently. Their relation to the public nature of heritage is also different. While one acts on behalf of the wider community in the public name, the other works for private advantage and seeks to exploit heritage as a resource. Both are equally entrepreneurial. The difference is in whose interests they serve. And can we have the next slide, please? So it's slide three. Thank you. In general, the greater degree of state control over heritage, the greater the extent to which the costs fall upon the state itself and are financed out of taxation. By contrast, where the state plays a smaller role, the greater the burden that falls upon those who use heritage assets. The general principle that applies is that of the polluter pays, whereby those whose activities may damage or destroy the heritage are required to pay some form of reparation, either to repair the damage or to mitigate the impact of their activity, or to provide a full investigation before possible loss. It's worth emphasising that all these different systems of heritage management work. The only limitation is the extent to which the principles upon which they are based are accepted by those they affect. In a country where it's assumed that the state should have total responsibility for the cultural heritage, a system of partial privatisation will not work because those who hope to benefit will not accept their burden cost. And this is what's been found in some African countries. By contrast, 
where private responsibility for heritage is the norm, greater state involvement and a consequently heavier burden in taxes will not be accepted as in the USA or Britain. Ultimately, it's belief in what the role of the state should be and attitudes towards regulation that determine the effectiveness of a heritage management regime, not specific mechanism. So I can have the next slide, please. Thanks. The most widely applied system of the polluter pays principle in relation to built heritage is in the field of archaeology where it's recognised that not all sites deserve to be preserved and that economic development is a vital factor in the modern world, contributing to the greater welfare. This so-called preventive archaeology is founded on three principles. That archaeology is a public good whose loss should be mitigated by the beneficiary of that loss, such as the developer. This is an extension into archaeology of the more general principle that anyone who causes damage should pay to repair it. Most commonly, it is seen in the idea that a polluter, such as a river or the air, should be responsible for decontamination. The second principle is that archaeology is only one among a range of factors affecting the suitability of any development work, and in the absence of any overriding archaeological imperative, other factors may require the loss of archaeology. And thirdly, that the primary value of archaeology is as a store of information about the past. In case of impending loss, that information should be retrieved. The purpose of such a system is not to interfere with development, as a system of automatic state ownership of material may do, for instance, by placing the responsibility for the material and its control away from those who own the land and thereby preventing any further activity. Instead, it places the responsibility on those undertaking development by making the costs of archaeological work part of the costs of the project. And those archaeological costs can be expected to be low in comparison to the overall cost and with the returns expected of the project whole. Where it differs in particular from a state control model, which is based on reactions to discoveries, is in attempting to identify in advance the likely presence of significant remains and thereby including any archaeological investigation in the development project itself. Ideally, archaeologists effectively work as part of the construction team, undertaking a specific task in relation to the project as a whole, included in its costings and in its planning as any other specialists are. Indeed, the model for such an approach lies in Western attitudes towards the natural environment. An archaeological survey in advance of development work can conveniently be included in any wider environmental impact assess assessment. Um, and this is an integral part of any development sponsored by the World Bank, for example. The same approach can be readily adapted in the case of existing structures by making those who wish to develop the site on which they stand responsible for mitigating any loss of historic and archaeological or, or architectural value. The idea of preventive archaeology um, emerged especially in Britain in the late 1980s, but it's now spreading across the world. Um, placing the responsibility for archaeology on those whose projects will lead to its destruction has the effect of removing archaeology from the realm of public concern and toward its privatisation. This is certainly the case in the UK, the USA and Australia, where archaeology is increasingly practiced by commercial archaeological units and consultants employed by developers. However, preventive archaeology is not entirely irrelevant to territories where the assumption of state ownership and responsibility for archaeological remains is the rule. Um, the French Institute in RAC, I won't attempt its pronunciation, is the state monopoly charged with ensuring the proper identification and treatment of archaeological remains by cooperating with regional and local archaeological services and private contributors. It was established in 2001 and derives from imperatives contained in the European Convention on the Protection of the Archaeological Heritage, as revised in Malta in 1992. INRAP has contributed to a shift in French archaeological practice from a single state controlled activity to one potentially divided between academic research and a professionalised commercial service, which represents a significant shift in the way archaeology is done and perceived in France. It's been argued that the principle of the polluter pays, which lies at the heart of preventive archaeology, offers the countries of the global south, such as India, 
who face the need to build infrastructure to support economic growth, a means to finance heritage work without placing a burden on the state. The scope for its extension, especially to Francophone African countries, was explored in a conference held in Mauritania in 2007, where both practical and ideological barriers to its adoption were considered, as well as its potential advantages. It's also the mode of approach favoured in Japan, and is emerging as an important aspect of archaeological practice in Poland. It does have some way to go before it achieves fully wider widespread adoption across the world, where an ideal of ancient buildings as national patrimony and state property persists, supported by strong state organisations in countries such as Greece and possibly as it is in India, it's unlikely to make headway, and that's been found also in Russia. Uh, this kind of approach has had two major consequences for heritage practice across the world. The first is to cement heritage preservation as a profession and to encourage the emergence of bodies responsible for regulating its practice, not by the imposition of laws from the outside, but by self-regulation from within. The second has been to provide scope for those newly professionalised practitioners of heritage conservation to organise themselves as private contractors at the service of developers who pay for the work, rather than as agents of the state. Where there is a long-standing tradition of self-regulated professions along the British model, these developments have not necessarily adversely affected heritage conservation. But in countries where there is no such tradition, and where professions and indeed university education provision generally is closely regulated by the state, it has had occasionally quite disastrous consequences, as in the Netherlands. Sorry, next slide, please. Alongside the rise Oh, sorry, can we go back one to community heritage? Thank you. Alongside the rise of such efforts to privatise heritage, there has been a similar rise in a concern for demonstrating heritage as something that belongs to the wider community rather than the state and its experts alone. The history of heritage engagement with the wider public goes back to the origins of the field. Um, in the late 19th century in Britain, Augustus Henry Lane Foxpit Rivers established his museum at Farnham to educate the workers on his estate into the inevitability of change through evolution rather than by revolutionary means, which he feared. At this period, and indeed earlier, the distinction between a concern for the protection of ancient remains and providing a public access to them did not yet exist. Preservation inevitably allowed access, while the provision of public access justified efforts at preservation. John Jameson in the States has charted the rise of two distinct public archaeologies there, um, from the pioneering work of Thomas Jefferson in promoting the heritage of Virginia, of Virginia directly to its population, through the increasing involvement of state and federal institutions in studying America's past, to a greater focus on preservation and the ultimate dominance of preservation over interpretation in federal programs. He argues that it was theoretical debates about interpretation among historic preservationists themselves, both academic and professional that led to a revived interest in public engagement in the 1980s. Others um, have outlined the range of public education programs that have developed in the USA and Britain over the past two decades, emphasising how recent the emergence of community projects has been. In Britain, um, Merriman has also outlined the distinction that has emerged between public archaeology as archaeology on behalf of the wider community and as engagement with the members of that community. He says that public archaeology as a public service relied upon public support in order to convince decision makers that archaeological sites needed protection. On this basis, the base case has been made by various people for programs of public education. And it's as public education that so much work with communities is seen in the Anglophone world. And this has been discussed in Merriman's, in Merriman's terms in several places. And the US-based societies for historical and American archaeology each delegate consideration of such issues to a public education and interpretation committee, um, and a public education committee, respectively. 
Such an approach, drawing on wider debates on the public appreciation of science, has been called by Merriman the deficit model of engagement with the public, in which non-professionals are assumed to be deficient in their understanding and appreciation of the field, and accordingly in need of education and thereby improvement. His alternative model is what he calls the multiple perspective model, in which recognition is given to the competing needs of different communities relating to their pasts and the different interpretations and uses to which such pasts can be put. Rather than offering a single and supposedly true past to our constituency, the aim is to offer the essential tools to evaluate the range of different interpretations on offer. A review of US significance literature about value from 1970 to 1994, pointed out that there was a clear sequence of changes in the emphasis in the field, from an early and heavy concentration on research to consideration of broader public and social values. Um, they, concern, uh, they attribute this shift um, to a rising concern for the stewardship of heritage, whereby heritage professionals are seen less as the primary stakeholder in relation to the management of heritage, that is, as the main beneficiaries of heritage practice, and more as custodians of heritage on behalf of a wider community. This marks the incorporation of public or community concerns directly into heritage practice, thus allowing community engagement to develop as a particular arm of the field, rather than accepting that claims of public interest should merely be mobilized as arguments for heritage work. Okay. It also becomes quite possible to separate out public outreach and stewardship from mainstream heritage preservation. This is not to suggest that we should regard the two as different, but it's important to be alert to the realities of heritage practice. The separation of direct public engagement from preservation and management of the heritage resource is at once testimony to and a product of the professionalisation of the field in the closing decades of the 20th century. As the heritage field increasingly becomes a specialist activity of those specifically trained and educated to undertake it, the discipline simultaneously subdivides into further specialism as well as the various branches of academic study and the division of those involved in the management of heritage into curatorial, investigative and consultancy roles. Engagement with the public also becomes a specialism in its own right. Many institutions responsible for... OK. Um, many institutions responsible for public engagement um, employ specialist staff, very often trained as educators, to undertake the role. Dr. Karaman? Space opening up for other agencies to become involved, including voluntary and commercial bodies. Okay, um, can we have the next slide, please? The Heritage and Global one. You have got one minute more. Yes, I've seen the sign in two minutes. Um, heritage is a global activity, and there isn't a country in the world that doesn't have some law relating to the management of its heritage. Um, heritage institutions operate at the national and global level. The result is that however localised the system of heritage management, um, it operates against a global background and constitutes part of the global endeavour that is heritage. But that doesn't remove responsibility for their own heritage from individual states. And all of this, um, yeah. so conclusions. At root, any system of heritage management can be made to work and work effectively so long as those who manage the system and those it affects are in agreement about the role of agencies involved. To those to impose controls where there has previously been reliance on private initiatives is to court resistance. To give new freedom to private initiatives where the state has been relied upon is to release forces that no one involved will be prepared to meet. So the question arises, can you learn from other countries? And I think the answer is that yes, you can, but you, what you can't do is simply transpose others' practices to your own country. And what you really need to think about for yourself in constructing a system of heritage management is what you consider to be heritage and what is not heritage. How important is it to preserve it, or can it play other roles in society, in the economy, or even maybe in politics? And what are the proper roles and relationships between the state and other bodies? Once you answer those questions, you can then build a system that will work for you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Karaman. Thanks a lot. Uh, now we can we can have a couple of questions if anyone is having. I mean, how the system would run. You have got a question. Probably you will have to speak there or here. No, it's okay. There's a mic here. You can pick up the sound. Okay. So, speakers, uh, there are a few questions, and uh, Professor Durga Vasu, uh, you want to ask whom? Okay, okay. Uh, and my question is to Dr. Karman. Uh, hello, Dr. Karman, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Okay. So now you are talking about the public archaeology. And uh, as you know that uh, in Eastern India, especially in, the, uh, in our states, that is in West Bengal, most of the sites are located in the remote villages. So, and the villagers are, um, they don't know about the heritage, they don't know about the sites or the, the treasure uh, beneath the, uh, which, uh, the, the treasures which they have. So how could we apply or um, um, that public archaeology, how could we involve the people, the village people? Because most of the peoples are not properly educated. Uh, so what do you suggest about this? So we want to apply definitely public archaeology. We want to involve all the public. Because I, uh, I have seen, because um, when I ex excavated a particular site, that People don't know about this heritage, the national treasure, and nothing. And so, how could it be possible in this country, in this particular area, uh, like India, and so many sites are located in the villages? So, what do you suggest? Thank you. Um, I mean, this is a this is a, an issue, of course, uh, that. Uh, affects not only India but all sorts of parts of the world and indeed um, arises in a slightly modified form um, in countries of, of Europe as well. Um, my answer um, is to ask really whether what you consider to be heritage is what the local population of these places considers to be heritage. I mean, if there is a clear distinction between what uh, academic views um, as to what constitutes heritage and what uh, the local people regard as important to them, then they will never um, you know, persuade them to be interested in that heritage for the simple reason um, that it's nothing to do with them. Um, my if you define heritage as those things that matter to a particular community, then the answer is to find out what matters to that particular community. It may be that there is some importance that they give to a particular place or a particular site. They just don't give it academic um, importance. They don't give it the same kind of importance that you do or that I might. Um, so it's more important, I think, to find out what does matter to them and then to work with them um, in order to uh, help them uh, take advantage of what, after all, is their heritage. Um, and I think one of the... the um, I appreciate that, of course, the, you know, the state does have a role in, in this, but if you're concerned with engaging with communities, then you have to ask the community um, what matters to them, rather than trying to impose on them um, an idea of what should matter to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can take one more question only. Any other question? Who is there? Somebody Yeah. You can concise your question because we have a shortage of time. I'll ask Dr. Kaman only. Yeah. I hail from Tagore Shantini Kathan. What I just placed is recently there were a lot of problems that what is the earning, what is the 
you know, maintenance and pollution and all that. The brief uh, year was that per year, one million people visit Shantiniketan, and the earning goes to the tune of at least 50 to 80 crores. Now, in our general taxation system, I suggested that 80 percent tax comes for the tourism. Now, in 80 percent, 18 percent, state and center has a share. Can that be? Sh can that not be shared with the universities because it is the Tregor Trust for which the tourism is taking place? That's the question. That's all. Probably he couldn't hear. He couldn't hear, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Huh? Okay, okay, ma'am. Uh, yes, my question is to Professor Sargi, if you are there. Professor Sargi? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, you are talking about the Soroka Castle and you have recently opened for the tourists. So, uh, just if you could tell me uh, about the visitor charges and uh, how you have evaluated that, like entry fees or any visitor charges you are uh, applying and uh, have you uh, applied that on the basis of any heritage valuation or anything like that? Excuse me, but I couldn't understand because the sound is very. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Could you repeat or some somebody from from the? Uh, yeah, she wants to know the entry fee to the castle. Has it been fixed on the basis of certain grounds? How how you have fixed the entry fee? The amount of entry fee to the castle? How it has been fixed? The rates. <laughs> On the basis of, uh, yeah. I, I'll just the sound, it's, yeah, it's very, I don't know exactly what's happening, but the sound is very strange, so it's echo. Yeah, could you yes. type the questions, yes. it would be much easier. Yes, I think that would have been better. Good. Uh, sir, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you, but yeah. Yeah, actually for revenue generation, if you are uh, charging any uh, thing to the visitors, like visitor charges for the Soroka Castle when you have opened to the tourists, is it based on certain heritage valuation method or how you have fixed up? Have you fixed up anything? Any any visitor charges for visiting the Soroka yeah, yeah. Castle? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, briefly, Soroka Castle is under uh, administration of the local historic and ethnographic museum, and of course they have uh, the fee entrance fee for the visitors, uh, which is symbolic. Of course, I think it's just a couple of cents, so it's not so so expensive to visit the castle itself inside of the castle. But because the castle is placed in another part of the city and museum is in the center of the city, of course you have to pay for two ki tickets. Uh, uh, it's not a combined ticket, so one ticket for both uh, sites or uh, castle and museum. But it's very symbolic. I don't know, didn't remember exactly, let's say 20, 20 cents. Uh, it's, it's just symbolic price to enter and to visit the castle. I think the problem for the visitors, it's a schedule. And we try to discuss with the administration because they are working during the weekends. And Monday and Tuesday, it's free. Actually, it's, it's closed, the museum. And some visitors, especially international visitors, who are coming on Monday or Tuesday, they could not visit the place. And we try to, to um, convince them to, do, to change the schedule and to be accessible on the, let's say, around the week. It's not yet solved, uh, which is which not so good. And also, during the summertime, at 6 in the evening, they are closing the doors which is also not so good. I think they have to change and adapt the schedule for the visitors, and that's why to be more open. But this is a common question, not just for Soroka Fortress or Museum. I think it's a common question for many other museums and sites in Europe or around the world. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for, to all the speakers, and it was a nice session, in fact. So once again, I thank uh, all the speakers as well as the delegates, listeners, for their patience. Thank you.
Thank you.